Let's get it. So Elle and I are going to, during this time together, we really want to unpack three questions today. Um, and really the three questions are coming from this desire and a hope to deepen our ethic of curiosity, to deepen our maturity around some of these topics. And so here are the three questions that we're going to be walking through today. Why do we think this is an important conversation for us to be having within UX? How does whiteness manifest in design in our practice? And how do we move closer to maturity and accountability? And then same question, but how does it manifest itself within culture teams and management? Um, because there is, yes, the practice, but then we also have to talk about the environment that supports the practice and the practitioner and the ways that this influences that. So we're going to work through those three things today. Um, again, you will not be a, a master's level student after this webinar, but our hope is that it sparks some curiosity and that you're willing to just take greater initiative and responsibility over your own learning journey. And so with that, I'm going to kick it to Alba to, to start us off. Um, you know, why, why do you think this topic, whiteness and UX, is an important conversation for us to be having? Yeah, thanks so much, Viv. And thanks so much for that grounding. A lot of love for you in the chat was happening as you were walking us through that. Um, so I think I will start off with kind of my background, because I think that really informs my perspective on uh, this topic. And my background is in the sociology of immigration and inequality. And so when I started transitioning into UX from academic uh, research about seven years ago, uh, one of the things that immediately struck me about how design professionals spoke about issues like design inclusion and equity was that it was seen as an add-on. You know, you had traditional user research and then you had user research about race. Uh, but what many design professionals don't really realize is that when you have an all white sample of research participants or most of your users are white, you are essentially doing race work. Um, you're just researching and designing whiteness. And when you bring that up to people, automatically get a sense of hesitation. It's like, oh, no, I, I don't study whiteness. What does that mean? I don't want to make any assumptions about what people are like because of their race. And yet folks are totally comfortable doing that with users of color or participants of color. And so there's this form of essentialism that we're willing to use in order to talk about participants or users of color. And yet we won't do the same thing with whiteness. And so that to me was a signal of, ooh, there might be a deeper issue here. And we'll unpack that as we uh, go through this webinar. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, my background too, for those of you who don't know, I come from a counseling and human service background, specifically trauma and addiction counseling, and then made a career switch into the lovely world of UX and tech. And I think for me, one of the things that really shocked me when I switched into this industry was for an industry that prides itself on being human centered, we really talk very little about the personal work that is required to actually do that well. Um, and so, you know, when I switched into UX, I mean, I, I thought it was interesting in terms of how little we were talking about things like whiteness and whatnot, but I think it's important for us to understand a little bit of context, right, within the UX industry. So when you think about kind of like that main first wave of UX leaders, you think about a lot of the folks who championed these methodologies around journey mapping, user personas, et cetera, et cetera. Like, it's also important to recognize what a lot of our leaders have been recognized as, right? A lot of them are white. Um, so it, it doesn't surprise me necessarily that we aren't necessarily having these conversations in light of how some of these methodologies have been constructed. Because I think most white people are unaware of their biases, their prejudices, and how they manifest into discriminatory behaviors. And, um, and I think a lot of that goes into us really needing to have this conversation around how do we actually start to understand the dynamics of whiteness? Um, 
And I think while it's admirable that a lot of white folks in UX see themselves as working towards inclusivity and equity, the self-perception of viewing oneself as an unbiased individual and capable of having either harmful thoughts or feelings are often a major barrier to really taking responsibility and admitting for one's biases and prejudices. Um, and really this commonly happens because most white people discount or diminish the impact of chronically being exposed to ethnocentric monoculturalism, which is really just a fancy way of saying white supremacy. Um, and, you know, I think it's okay to admit that reality, this difficult reality that because of the society we live in, it is nearly impossible for white folks to not inherit some of these biases and prejudices. And so it's really important for us to talk about that, especially when we're designing and researching these experiences. Yeah, and I just want to make a note because I think someone might have hinted at this in the um, in the chat, but I do want to acknowledge that over the last few years, especially since the trash fire that was 2020, there has been a renewed attention to ideas of racism and whiteness in this field. But I will say that there's some let's say problematic ways that these theories and frameworks that we're relying on actually help us understand whiteness. And so I wanna kind of unpack misunderstandings that people have about some of the popular frameworks that we use in order to kind of supply alternative ways of thinking about this. Mm -hmm. um, so, I'm pretty sure that there's a lot of people in this room who have engaged with a framework by Kenneth Jones and Tema Okun on a white supremacy culture, right? And for those of you who are not uh, familiar with that, that is essentially um, a framework that uh, points out how organizations unconsciously use certain norms and standards, uh, which make it difficult uh, to create an inclusive safe space for people who aren't white. Um, and so some of these like cultures and standards that they mention in their framework are things like individualism or professionalism or preference for the written word, a sense of urgency, and so on and so on. And when I first came in contact with this framework, which is a very popular framework, particularly in the education space and nonprofit space where I tend to work in, I was immediately struck by how it doesn't actually highlight the power of whiteness. Um, because one of the things that it does is that it tends to say that whiteness is these certain values, right? Whiteness is urgency, whiteness is the written word. But the thing is, though, you can not have a sense of urgency, and that can protect white people. You can not document things, and that can protect white people. And so I think it's really important that we make sure that any frameworks of whiteness that we use, any theories around whiteness, don't essentially essentialize whiteness as an identity, and then because of that, completely ignore the way that power and material change and material inequality is associated with whiteness. So I just wanted to put a little bit of a caveat there. If people drop that link in the chat, there's a reason why we didn't necessarily include it in our resource guide. And that's because it's a bit of a passive, I would say, framework. Um, yeah. But in terms of what can we replace that with? Right. And I don't know if you want me to kind of dive into that because I can talk about this for hours. Oh, um, I know you can. I just want to like before I guess we um, kind of like shift to that. I again just kind of like reiterating why this is important for us within UX and design is in the most simplest form. The reason why we need to have more conversations about whiteness and UX, understanding the way that it manifests itself with white people and people who aren't white, which we're gonna get into internalized whiteness in a little bit, is because it allows us to move to a more inclusive and holistic understanding of what does it mean to be human-centered. The fact that a lot of us talk about being human-centered 
and DEI as two separate things is problematic. In reality, when you think about DEI and what does that mean, that is just being human centered. But for some reason, we have to dichotomize the two. That's messed up. <laughs> and that influences then how we think about research. It influences then how the, the ways that we expect, especially non-white folks, to explain to everyone why you should care. And so it's not just causing harm then to participants and our stakeholders, but it's causing harm to practitioners in our community. Something that I've said before in the past is that when a community requires you to prove that you deserve dignity and perpetually share why people should care about honoring it, they're committing a collective act of violence. So this is so much bigger than just like protecting participants. It's about preservation of our field. It's about making sure that people can have a sustainable relationship with this work without feeling like they need to be the ones to advocate for, champion and fight for their voice and their appearance to matter. And so that's why this is also really important. I mean, where do you even go from there, right? That's it. We're just gonna end the webinar right there and uh, happy Friday. Um, no, but for real, it's super important for us to like learn how to like sit with these conversations. Um, and so with that, I do want us to like shift a little bit into what you're about to like dive into as well as what does this actually mean in terms of the practice? Yeah, so when I'm working with uh, organizations on how to make their practice more equity centered, I kind of bring up three observations that I've made about the ways in which we treat race, racism and whiteness in our practice. One is that our research tends to erase whiteness. Two, it erases the history and continuation of racial inequality. And three, it erases the presence and the continued presence of prejudice. So these three things, right, the erasure of whiteness, the erasure of racial inequality, and the erasure of prejudice is very much rooted in our separation of the practice from our notions of diversity, equity, and inclusion that Vivienne had brought up. Um, you know, in terms of erasing whiteness, if we want an example of that, that's exactly what I was talking about beforehand, right, where we tend to see an all white sample and not see anything wrong with that. Um, in terms of the erasure of racial inequality, this, I think, kind of gets to this notion of cultural competency that tends to come up a lot among designers and mm -hmm. researchers. Uh, and that is very much, I think, rooted in cultural essentialism. So I'm, let me give you an example of like a case because I think like there's a lot of words that I'm like throwing at people and let's kind of ground it in a case. So I was doing research uh, with a school that wanted to redesign the way that it uh, did its parental engagement. So they had noticed that, wow, like we have a school that's predominantly black and predominantly Latinx. And yet we're seeing that the Latinx parents are just not engaging in the classroom. Like what, what's going on here? So when I was originally talking with stakeholders, they were like, oh, well, it has to be cultural, right? Like, oh, they're, they're recent immigrants. They don't understand the culture of schools in the United States. They don't understand that they have to come in. Um, hmm. And it was immediately that there was a deficiency in that group, right? Like they just needed to learn English. They needed to learn laws. They needed to learn policies. They needed to learn culture here. And that's what I think we tend to do a lot when we are engaging with racial and ethnic minorities in our work. We see a behavior and we immediately attribute it to something cultural, something individualistic, something that's wrong with them. Mm -hmm. But when I started doing research at that school, I also started speaking with the Black parents that were doing something different than the Latinx parents were. So Latinx parents, low levels of engagement. Black parents were super engaged. I'm like, huh, that's kind of interesting. And when I started talking with these parents, they immediately revealed that the reason why they were super engaged in the classroom is because they've had a lot of racist interactions with principals, teachers, 
and staff members. And so for them, that you know, presence in the classroom was a protective measure against the racism within the school. It was not necessarily like a cultural thing, right? It's a defense against racial inequality that is happening in that particular environment. And so if I had just stayed with that assumption that stakeholders had given to me where, oh, this must be a cultural defect, it must be a cultural limitation, I would have completely missed the fact that that school is very racist towards parents who are not white. And that is the problem that we need to fix, not necessarily the individual parents. And this type of, I call it like a deficiency model of human behavior, comes around in a lot of people's projects, especially those of us who are doing work in the civic tech space, the social sector space, or even just like spaces that are really focusing on equity, focusing on the wrong parts of equity and focusing more on the victims of it rather than the perpetrators of it. Ooh. I appreciate that example. And I also just, um, I think to your point, like you mentioned earlier about how we don't necessarily focus on the ways that we e erase whiteness. It's more so like, okay, like, well, what's happening with like the black community? What's happening with this community, this community? And I think part of that is just like an awareness, right? And that goes into that natural default. Um, and that's just not just with white people. I think that's with non-white people too. Like we also have been and have probably engaged in moments where we have erased whiteness and have continued to be a part of some of the harm that might come from that. Um, and so like, I bring that up because I think a lot of times in these conversations, like, yes, there's like a lot of things that happen when it comes to like white privilege being ignored or unchecked and the racism and things that happen with that, that happen with that. But I think also as non, as a non-white practitioner, I too have to be aware of the ways that I've been conditioned to prioritize whiteness, to prioritize thinking that is racist and that might cause harm to like other groups outside of my own community as well. Oh, I mean, absolutely. And I think, you know, one place where I'm starting to see this a lot in is in this push towards like trauma-informed approaches uh, that we have in our lovely industry, right? This is great, right? We want to make sure that our practices and our protocols are trying to keep participants safe, that they're trying to keep us as practitioners safe, that they're trying to keep uh, the stakeholders that we engage with safe. And yet we never think about whiteness in our trauma-informed approaches. Um, one of the things that I'm always like struggling with when I see a lot of uh, trauma-informed research guides is that they never talk about the fact that me as someone who is racially ambiguous, right? I am a person of color, but like depending on the context, people are going to miscategorize me. Um, I am in a way a lot safer than Vivianne would be in the field because she is a black woman, right? And then we don't see that that is reflected in the protocol. So if I know that we're going into a geographic area or we're doing enterprise research in a white dominated field, and yet we do not create protocols in place for a racist participant to say something to Vivian or a racist participant to follow up with her and like stalk her on LinkedIn or her email because he has that information because wow. we did the research engagement. That is never actually outlined before we go out into the field. Um, and it's the same thing with me. Like I do a lot of work with uh, immigrants. And so that means that I sometimes do work in, uh, do translation work, right? Cause I'm going from English to Spanish. Every single time that I talk with a participant, I translate what a participant says. I look at the data of what a participant says, and then I build up a slideshow or some type of synthesis of what the participant said. I am engaging with that person's potentially traumatic story over and over and over again. 
And that is not accounted for when we're talking about the structure of our research teams. Maybe I should not be doing field work if I'm also responsible for engaging with this really sensitive, disturbing, traumatic data over and over again, because that's going to be emotionally dangerous for me. So we always have to kind of think about how are our identities, our backgrounds, our personal experiences being accounted for when we are creating our care-centric, trauma-informed protocols and practices. Yeah. And I think it also brings apart, it brings up the importance of understanding how we, the role of shame and like pity within our relationship to whiteness and how we prioritize whiteness. I'll give you two examples. Um, and then a lot of you will resonate with this first example. There's a reason why, and I say this often, there's a reason why book clubs are hot in the summer of 2020 and they're not hot now. Why? Because in the summer of 2020, a lot of people were depending on white people feeling bad, ashamed, and guilty to care. And let me tell you, these are not sustainable emotions or motivators. There's a reason why, even in terms of like tone and talking about it, like a lot, just physically, like we can't sit in shame for a long time. The part of your brain that's activated when you experience shame is actually the part of your brain that's activated when you experience trauma. Shame is not helpful in terms of, shame is highly correlated to addiction, eating disorders, depressant, guilt, inverse, guilt inverse of that. Guilt is healthy. Shame is I am the mistake. Guilt is I made a mistake. Shame is an internalization into the self. Guilt is focused on behavior. And so what we've seen and what we saw in the summer of 2020 is really like the centering of whiteness around DEI and people caring about what's happening with the black community. And it was driven on pity and shame and feeling bad and sad. Now I see this happen as well within UX and, de and design. I see it in terms of presentations. When you're trying to get a stakeholder to give you that yes, and you essentially try and use, for lack of better words, trauma porn to make them feel bad enough about this population for them to say yes. And like in doing so, you're like centering whiteness in that moment and you're leveraging shame and really un, an unhealthy relationship with that community in order to center a yes and like whiteness within that conversation. Um, and so I've seen that a lot and how we are trying to advocate for people, but really causing harm in the midst of it. Yeah. And one of the things I always say is uh, content designers and research ops people, you all are in a very strategic position to stop your team from centering whiteness. Yeah, and please. to uh, Vivian's point about the element of shame and using people's stories in unethical ways. I was recently uh, reading the work of Tonya Sutherland, who is a scholar of uh, librarianship. And she brought up the point of when we create these databases of these like stories, right? Of people who have experienced racial trauma and inequality and all of that, we don't give people like the right to be forgotten. We don't give people the right to have alternative uh, interpretations of their stories. We don't give them the right to contextualize the pain. We don't give them the right to surface things that are not painful about their lives, right? We essentially put things on display just like European colonizers did several centuries ago, but we're just replicating that as researchers, right? Like as researchers, we are architects of racism, of whiteness, of colonialism, even though we may not necessarily think of it like that. Yes, yes. Yeah, and so, you know, kind of talking about the practice, um, I wanna shift a little bit into culture teams and management, but I guess if you, do you have anything else you want to like wrap that up with before we switch over? I mean, there's so much more. So like, I wanna <laughs> make sure that like, we're talking about these workplaces as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, again, and again, like our hope is like, you get curious about some of these topics and then you take initiative to go and continue learning instead of like, that was a cute little webinar, that was interesting and then you move on. So lean into that ethic of curiosity as we're kind of going through our conversation. But I do think it's important, you know, we have a lot of conversations about 
whiteness in terms of the practice? What does that mean for research, for design? But I think we also need to have a conversation about how does whiteness manifest um, in culture and teams and management, the environment that really supports these practices. Um, and so, I mean, there's, there's a lot of ways where we could start with what does this look like? I think um, one of the biggest ways that I've noticed is <clears throat> especially when, you know, we see this a lot with our work when we work with like corporate clients where you bring in someone who has a deeper understanding and expertise on this matter. And then what usually happens, and this is not just unique to us, this is I think a common occurrence, is then I as a black woman have to convince white leaders and get them to a place where they feel like they are the ones in power they are the ones who are the experts in order to sign off on and invest in and believe in what needs to be done in order to actually move towards a more human-centered approach to the practice, culture, and management. That is centering whiteness, where I'm having to, again, make sure that my white stakeholder is making sure that they feel like they feel like they have the power and the expertise in order for them to then sign off on something that I'm speaking about and speaking into. Um, I remember we were working with a client once <clears throat> and uh, they were like, you know, I wish uh, you had given us more ideas around how to be more trauma informed, how to be more equitable in our practice. And um, even though we gave a lot of ideas and I said to them, I was like, no, you don't. I was like, no, you don't. I'm like, that's not the problem. I'm like, you don't need more ideas. You know how many ideas there are about how to sleep better, how to eat better, how to be off your phone more? I'm like, the problem isn't exposure to ideas. The problem is implementation. The problem is overcoming your fear. The problem is overcoming your shame. The problem is how do I help you to feel brave enough, bold enough to do what is right, to do what is good, despite you not being fully comfortable and not having all power and knowledge within it. I'm like, that's the problem. And that really boils down to the centering of whiteness <laughs> within these conversations. Um, I'll pause there because I could go on. Um, I know we're gonna have to like timestamp the transcript for this of just like, we need to pause this because I'm gonna go off on this for another hour. Yeah, I mean, you know where I'm a researcher. So one of the things that I'm always uh, trying to think about is how are organizations almost like researching their own orgs, right? Like how uh, how is the DEI function of an organization uh, actually trying to take into consideration the experiences of um, their non-white employees? And one of the things that... I think is representative of that, again, invisibility of whiteness that I talked about earlier is this notion of scarcity in DEI efforts. Um, one of the things that we often hear when we're talking with like clients who are you know, trying to get a equity initiative off the ground is you know, what, what groups do we focus on? Here. Like we have limited funds, like who, who do we focus on? What will have the biggest impact? And I always find it really interesting that there's this tendency for stakeholders to pit racial minority groups with each other, right? Like, oh yeah, we're going to focus on Black employees, but we're not going to focus on Asian employees because, oh, like they, they, they're they doing fine in numbers or, oh, there there's not that many of them in the company, so we don't necessarily have to pay attention to it. And to me, I'm like, well, wait a minute, but why are we comparing mm. like non-white groups with each other? Why aren't we actually studying how whiteness works in the org itself, right? There's this great book by a historian named Ira Katz Nelson, where he talks about how affirmative action was white. And what he means by that is that historically, all of these government initiatives, uh, social services, resources that were given to citizens uh, in the US were all directed to white people. And then once uh, black Americans like came back from World War II and started demanding uh, 
you know, rights because, hey, we just like died for your country abroad during World War II. That was when the government was like, ooh, we're going to put some institutional barriers. We're going to change the laws. We're going to change the narrative around uh, what it means to access social services. And we're going to stigmatize Black Americans from using it, right? So they changed the goal of affirmative action. Now we can see the same thing actually in organizations as well. Why are we studying the deficiencies of minoritized employees? Like what do they need? Like what do they need in terms of mentorship? How can we sponsor them more? How can we increase their leadership potential? And instead, why aren't we figuring out, well, how is affirmative action happening in the company? that is over hiring like white employees, right? How are we thinking about the informal ways that uh, white employees are being promoted or they're being hired, right? Always try to think about what is invisibilized. It's whiteness here. So one of the things that we do when we're working with clients is that we try to think about how is whiteness manifesting in your DEI function? How is your affirmative action white? I love that call out of, we often focus on, especially when we're looking at like in the problem space, what's happening, what's, you know, what, what do my historically marginalized folks need in terms of mentorship and support? What do they need in terms of, and we study that instead of, let's study how white folks in the company and the organization, what are their behaviors? that might be contributing to this kind of environment where attrition is really high for these communities. Like that, and I'm trying to like imagine a, a company and org where they're like, yes, we're gonna study this and we're gonna do it in this way. But again, the reason why, it's that erasure. It's the understanding of centering whiteness in everything that we do. Um, and that's just like, it's subtle, right? Cause like, now that you've heard about it, you probably won't unsee it. Now you're going to like be in your company. You're going to hear about all these initiatives. And now it's just going to be that, that little agitation that's going to be happening as you're thinking about like, wait, why are we throwing money at this when we should be understanding, okay, well, how does this play out? Uh, I'll say this for example, as well, as we're thinking about culture, team and management, um, and you're thinking about the role of whiteness in this is like, <clears throat> there's two things. One is what kinds of conversations and experts are you investing in to come and support your team? For me personally, I when I lived when I was in corporate America, I hated Black History Month. Hated it. Why? Because do I need Alicia Keys as a guest speaker telling me how dope it is to be black? No. <laughs> do I need another webinar on microaggressions when really we should just be calling it racism and sexist behavior? No. What I do need is education, support around the ways that whiteness can cause harm, the ways that we need to rethink and challenge how we think about accountability so we can have healthier environments and systems to work within. I don't need LL Cool J telling me about his, how he's like a multimillionaire and how all these things like, and so it's, it's very gimmicky, it's very truncated, it's very shallow and immature. And so how do we start to move from relevancy to maturity is the question. Um, and the other thing I want to bring up that I kind of teased out earlier was this idea around how, again, like in terms of centering whiteness, it's not just white people who can be a part of this, but it's also non-white folks. Um, I often think about, and the way that I describe this is the sunken place. So uh, if you haven't seen The Sunken Place, uh, if you could drop that link to the clip, uh, watch this when you have time. But there's this scene in um, this movie called Get Out. It's the 2017 box office thriller where the audience is introduced to this terrifying reality that the main character finds himself descending into after being hypnotized by his girlfriend's mother. And it's called The Sunken Place. And Jordan Peele, and I don't do scary movies, but what I love about Jordan Peele is just how he uh, puts a lot of meaning into his movies. And so Jordan Peele talks about the sunken place. He describes it as this. He says, the sunken place is something that exists not just for Black people, but for women, for our Latino brothers and sisters, for any marginalized group that gets told not to say what they're experiencing. 
it's the system, it's all these cogs in the wheel that sort of keep us where we are. The sunken place is the silencing, it's the taking away of our expression. And so when I'm thinking about, when you're using language like erasure, I'm also thinking about the silencing. I'm thinking about the sunken place. And so the point I wanna make here is simple, is that when we passively or proactively choose to not do the personal work necessary to acknowledge how whiteness influences our work, to understand the benefits that it grants some versus others, and when we don't commit to doing the personal work needed to protect our research and design decisions from our biases, then you are supporting the sunken place. You're supporting the system. The system that allows us to believe the lie that UX is primarily about behavior divorced from historical or, or cultural context. The system that continues to have mostly white and or mostly male speakers and panelists at conferences. The system that causes white liberal progressive individuals to think that they're excused from conversations regarding privilege, bias, and efforts related to diversity, inclusion, and belonging. The system that conveniently doesn't challenge women-centered organizations in our industry to think about, act on, and acknowledge intersectionality. The system that utters excuses like not enough women applied or there aren't enough qualified minorities for this position. The system that would rather see pri and prioritize grace to someone who has a history of being racist, sexist, and harmful to others than justice and support for individuals who've been silenced, harmed, and whose voice have been deemed unworthy to be heard. The sunken place. And so we have to ask ourselves, how are we enabling and supporting the system, the sunken place for others and for ourselves? Uh, like this notion of like, how is our system supporting the sunken place? It just like puts me, uh, like it, it makes me think of the concept of identity capitalism, right? And the ways in which, because we work in very racist organizations that only view whiteness and only value the participation and work of white employees, that this notion of let me focus on things that will give me visibility in the organization in order to get power is one of the few viable pathways that minoritized employees have, right? So you're going to have folks who enter into the DEI space, not because they have a deep expertise in how racism and whiteness works within their organization, but because of the color of their skin and them acknowledging that that may be one of the few pathways that they have of any visibility within their org. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, I see in the chat, I've seen in the questions, um, a lot of people, especially within design, I think automatically go to like blaming capitalism. And I think the very brief like rant I'll make about that is one, I feel like blaming capitalism at this point is like shooting fish in a barrel. Like, yes, capitalism. But also I think for like UX design and researchers, the really the greater question is who told you that your position wasn't designed and isn't in service of capitalism? And so when you kind of like sit with that, when you sit with the reality of capitalism, like how some of the things within your organizations actually stem from advice given to plantation owners in order to make their slaves more productive. There's a book called, I think it's called Accounting for Slaves. And it talks about things like reorgs. Plantation owners were encouraged to do reorgs. So that way the slaves couldn't collect, you know, share knowledge and like have like this sense of unity. Employee of the month came from slave of the month. Times lunches, plantations. Plantation owners were encouraged to do these things. So it's like, once you understand that and then just understand and accept it, you don't always have to like blame capitalism every single day for it. It's just, it is what it is at this point, right? Um, then you can start to be creative. Then you can start to be curious. Then you can start to be bold in terms of how do you challenge and change these things. So even in terms of like organizational efforts, like how do you 
kind of like understand challenge these things around like whiteness, for example. Um, I think when you have an understanding of the systems that you're in, when you have hope for what could be different, you can get creative as you are making a pitch and getting buy-in in terms of getting support for an outside expert to come in and support you or to create more space internally to explore rituals that need to be baked within your project life cycle in order to limit harm and be more care-centered. Um, I remember I had a manager who, I remember sitting her down and being like, my assumption is you've never managed a black woman before. And she was like, that is correct. I'm like, cool. So here are just some things that you should know that will be helpful for me and helpful for you in our working relationship. I don't need feedback on my personality. I need feedback that allows me to line up to um, a specific goal and metric. Um, here are just things that you just don't say to black women in terms of can't touch your hair, you're being really aggressive and angry, all these things. And here's some articles that you can read to go deal with and understand why that is. Now it's up to that person to go take initiative. But if you are a manager on this call and you're recognizing, oh, I actually manage someone who isn't white and I haven't taken any initiative to understand how my feedback might be experienced and perceived by them given culture, history, all these things, like that's on you. And so the encouragement, the hope is that you'd be curious, that you'd be hopeful that you can make a workplace experience different. Um, that you would start to think about within your companies. It's not just about networking with product managers and stuff. You need to get buddy-buddy with HR. You need to learn how to make friends with sales leaders in your orgs. You need to pull up the 10K report if you are a publicly traded company in, the, in America and look at what's being talked about to investors about opportunities within your business and your employer so that you can be equipped and skillful in making a case to be more human-centered and inclusive in your organization, in your design work. So it's a, it's a little bit of curiosity and creativity. You got to like step outside the box a little bit in order to actually see that progress that you want to be made. Yeah. So, I mean, like we have a couple more minutes left. And so I'm wondering, Vivian, like based off of that, like mm -hmm. what are you kind of thinking about in terms of like, What's like one strategy people can use to stop centering whiteness in their org? Yeah. Or practice. Ooh, I feel like um, there's a lot. And actually, Alba, we should probably just make an ebook on this and like share it with people. Um, so we'll make a note of that and get to that uh, the next month or so. But I think for me, my approach has always been um, relationship and story. So I have found that, again, a lot, of, a lot of the reasons why people aren't willing to engage thoughtfully with this topic is because of shame and fear. And so one of the ways that I challenge people to relate to that and to lean into that understanding is I use a lot of metaphors and allegories, which means I read a lot of books. I don't even listen to sermons. I like listening to sermons because I think I learn a lot from pastors in terms of how they use story and try to connect it to a point. Um, and I've started to actually document some of these different illustrations that I use. So um, I think for me, it's like getting better at storytelling and exposing yourself to like the craft of like story. How do you do it in a way that is influencing and causes people to be curious? Um, and the other thing is relationship. So I worked at Salesforce for about two years, but within year one was on a FaceTime and texting basis with some of our C-level executives. Um, had the chief people officer give me a budget of 20K for an executive coach. And I was just a manager in a design work. How did I do that? I was really intentional to really want to understand the business and build relationships with people that understood those leaders in order for me to like gain access to those folks and to that circle. And so that led to influence. That led to me being able to advocate for something in the design org and be able to reference that I have the chief people officer stamping approval of this. And so it got pushed through. And so it's like being like thoughtful and creative in your relationships. I would put reminders in my phone. I would put like, I would calendar things of when I would swing back to people, being very thoughtful and intentional. So I would say invest in how you develop relationships within your company and how do you develop your craft of storytelling. Oh, I love that. Yeah. 
Um, I think for me, and I'm going to kind of combine some of my answers to some of the questions that were dropped in the uh, Q&A, like around how do we actually do this in practice? Um, I think for me on a more abstract level, I think one of the best ways that you can use your researcher impulse of curiosity is to identify the negative knowledge and strategic ignorance that is in your organization. So what do I mean by that? Negative knowledge is the knowledge that people are afraid of Ooh. in your org. So things that they don't want to know about, right? Ooh. So if you see, for example, that certain things are not documented, if you see that certain things are not talked about explicitly, if you see that certain things are only talked about behind closed doors and there's no transparency, that's negative knowledge. And so we can do the same thing around how racism and whiteness manifest in our products and services is what do your stakeholders not want to know about? So it's not just a gap, it's what are they actively avoiding? And then strategic ignorance is the way that people don't ask questions so that they can seem powerful. Because if we know the answer to it, then we lose power. So this is like your PMs, or this is like certain stakeholders who are like, oh, if I know the answer to this, that means that I'm going to get in trouble because that has to do with my accountability metrics or my account or my performance management uh, criteria. So that's strategic ignorance. And I think the second thing on a more kind of like practical grounded level is we just have to be very careful on how we use language when describing race, racism, and uh, whiteness. I am very specific when I say that I'm talking about racism. I'm not talking about race. Because that, again, essentializes and blames the victims of racism rather than identifying the system that is harming them. So I never say that group X does Y behavior. I'm going to talk about because of these conditions of society, we see patterns of Y behavior among some people in group X. So two very different framings, um, but they're really important in that they identify explicitly for all parties involved, what is the thing that needs to change? And yeah. that's what we need to design for, not the people who have been harmed. Let's go. Let's get it. I love that. Um, ooh, yeah, an hour is just too short. An hour is too short to like get into a topic like this. But honestly, like what, just like an incredible group of folks. Like I love the energy in the chat. I love the questions, discussions. Love how y'all made it, this a space for us to learn and feel less alone in this journey, right? Because I don't think we talk a lot enough about how being in UX and design can be a really lonely journey. You can feel lonely, feel frustrating. Um, and I truly believe that being a UX professional is one of the greatest personal growth opportunities that exists. If you're intentional with how you relate to this work, with how you're intentional with relating to your commitment to being more human-centered towards others and towards yourself, the ways that we can grow and bloom into the person that we want to be, that you know you can be, can be endless. And so this webinar, again, it's only an hour, but if you want more experiences like this, if you want to feel less alone in this work, if you want to feel more hopeful about what could actually be different and how we can truly get there, then I'd like to invite you to join the Humanity Centered community. Um, Alba will put in the chat, but the Humanity Centered community is, Honestly, for me, it's like one of the most encouraging personal growth and professional growth communities to really support you in your pursuit of something better. And we have live monthly workshops, discussion sessions, mini courses, and more. And so one of the things that we've been thinking about this year is how can we be really intentional and in serving and loving on the UX and design community? We all have seen how Q1 has been brutal for our industry, for our community. And a lot of us have been hurting. A lot of us have been suffering. And I think a lot of companies and leaders have been leaning into two things, hoarding and exploiting, right? How can I hoard as many resources to myself? And how can I exploit and take as much from my customers, from our people? And so I was talking to, Alba and I have been talking since December around, for us, the opportunity in 2023 is giving and extending. How can we give more? 
how can we support more our community? So it's one of the reasons why within this community, Alba leads a group called Practical Ethics. These are workshops where really gives y'all the opportunity to learn new approaches to ethics and equity centered practices and uses real life case studies and scenarios. I lead a group called Restoring Care. So this is more so on the, on the side of how do you understand, overcome and heal from organizational trauma, from workplace trauma and hardship? How do you uh, make sure that you don't lose yourself when you're experiencing chronic grief? Um, and so we've been thinking about how do we give? How do we give and support y'all? And so one of the things that we're doing is uh, for the community for this year, we're offering lifetime access for $200. So instead of paying a thousand plus dollars for a two to three day conference with a few workshops, you can have access to an active community of folks who get you, who see you, who are intentional and hopeful, up to 18 plus workshops and working sessions, additional resources and more for $200. Because at the end of the day, um, we are a people and purpose driven organization and we wanna figure out how do we support y'all? How do we love on y'all and help you feel less alone in this work? And so, um, Alba, again, we'll drop that in the chat. We would love for you to be a part of that community. Super dope, super diverse, super interesting. Um, and thank y'all for taking time, energy, and space to sit in this conversation. Um, thank you for betting on you and investing in you. And so I hope you have a wonderful weekend. I hope you bury your work laptop in the deepest, darkest hole you can find. I hope you get outside, get some air. Um, and that you remain hopeful in the ability to choose courage over comfort. So I appreciate y'all. Have an amazing weekend. We'll send out the recording later and we'll talk soon. All right. Bye everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you y'all.